All right, Assalamu alaikum, uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, coming out to support the uh, first inaugural um, Charlotte Muslim Forum meeting. Um, you know, we're a diverse collection of Muslimin, both male and female, um, with a unique goal. And that goal is um, to help the Charlotte Muslim community be more, com be more comfortable in um, asking questions pertaining to, um, pertaining to their faith and help them understand the wisdom behind our religious teachings. We look to unite the Muslim community as a whole and bring out our oneness through the collaborative efforts of our community's knowledgeable imams and religious leaders in an effort to educate our community on manners dealing with differing opinions. Um, inshallah, tonight we're going to have uh, five very knowledgeable speakers. Uh, four from the community and one guest who will tackle the topic of the night entitled Agreeing to Disagree. How the various schools of thought brought strength and unity through diversity. I was having an interfaith uh, talk with uh, one of my non-Muslim uh, colleagues and he made a comment to me um, and said, he, he told me that um, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than uh, being in a garage makes you a car. And uh, that's my attempt at a joke there to kind of lighten the mood. But uh, uh, as funny as I found that analogy being, uh, I, it made me think a little bit. And it made me think about uh, how Muslims are getting these burning questions that they have answered if they're not necessarily going to a masjid or taking a class to get those questions answered. Um, you know, are they using Google? Um, you know, are they, um, are, are they questioning the correct people? Um, so we feel we have an abundant resource in our community um, of knowledgeable people where we can have a forum like this and ask the questions that we need to ask um, and, and, and learn from the topics that, that you know, uh, have been burning inside of us. Um, so inshallah, tonight um, we're going to have this program. We have five speakers that will bless us with their knowledge um, for a 50-minute period. Um, we will then have um, a brief intermission. We will have some announcements and people can go out and have refreshments. Um, after this intermission, um, we're going to have an hour-long question and answer session. Now, um, I ask that um, there will be volunteers walking around with uh, teal name tags on. Um, and they will be passing out, um, if you have not received one already, note cards um, and pens where you can ask questions. Um, make sure on the question card, you uh, are able to uh, pinpoint if you want the question addressed to a specific imam or whether it's open to anybody to answer. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, afterwards, you don't need to put your name on there. Um, it's not necessary for you to, uh, uh, you know, to say who you are. If you'd like to, that's fine, but uh, you can keep them anonymous. Um, and uh, to uh, start things off, um, the best way to start off um, any meeting um, like this is to uh, start with the recitation of Quran, inshallah. So um, I have Brother Osama read some verses for us in a translation given by Sister Ration. Assalamu alaikum. How's everybody doing tonight? There's no better way to start than to start with the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask him to accept from us, inshallah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu attaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa an. وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا وَاذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ كُنْتُمْ أَعْدَاءً فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِكُمْ فَأَصْبَحْتُمْ بِنِعْمَتِهِ 
وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون صدق الله عظيم Sisteration will provide us with the translation In the name of Allah, the most merciful and the most generous. Chapter 3, verse 102. O you who believe, fear Allah by doing all that he has ordered and by abstaining from all that he has forbidden, as he should be feared. Obey him, be thankful to him, and remember him always. And die not except in a state of Islam, with complete submission to Allah. Verse 103. And hold fast, all of you together, to the rope of Allah. And be not divided among yourselves, and remember Allah's favor on you. For you were enemies one to another, but he joined your hearts together, so that by his grace you become brethren in Islamic faith. And you were on the brink of a pit of fire, and he saved you from it. Thus Allah makes his ayat, his proofs, his evidences, his verses, his lessons, his signs, his revelations clear to you. So that you may be guided. I mean. MashaAllah, a beautiful recitation and translation from Brother Osama and Sister Rachel. Uh, we are going to, before we get to the Imams, uh, we have uh, um, some entertainment that some brothers have uh, prepared for us. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce them um, to the floor at, right now. So basically we got some Oscar nominated actors just about to come through right now. Um, they got a skit. It's gonna they're gonna replay the scenario of Bana Koreida. And so right as soon as we get started, we just want to show a little hadith that started this all. So the Prophet said in the hadith, which is in Sayyid al Bukhari, narrated Ibn Amr, on the day of Al Ahzab, the Prophet said, None of you Muslims should offer the Asa prayer but at Bana Koreida. I guess they're not ready yet. Now when the Sahaba were on the way to Bani Qurayda, Asr time became due. The time for Asr is running out, we're spraying out. But I thought the Prophet told us not to pray until we got to Bani Qurayda. But if you wait until we reach Bani Qurayda, we'll miss Asr. But the Prophet still told us not to pray until we got to Bani Qurayda. So due to our current circumstances and our learnings, we should pray Asr now. But the Prophet ﷺ told us literally, don't pray until we get to Bani Quraida. We should listen to the Prophet ﷺ. The Sahaba are now split up into two groups. The Sahaba had a difference of opinion and perspective on when to pray Asr. They were split up into two groups. On the right side, the literal group who maintained a consistent meaning regardless of the context and the situation and said, no, we shouldn't pray Asr until we get to Bani Quraida. And group two on the left side, the figurative group, who, interrupt, who interpreted the circumstances and other rulings to determine their decision. This group of Sahaba understood that the Prophet ﷺ was telling them to hurry up and be at Bani Qurayda by a certain time. That is how they understood the statement and continued. We're right. No, we're right. Let's just all agree to disagree. Oh, mashallah. So... So both groups shook hands and peacefully agreed to disagree, but each group still thought that their decision was the correct one. While one group prayed right away, the other group continued until they arrived at Bani Qurayda and prayed Asr there. When both groups arrived, they told the Prophet wasallam what happened, and the Prophet did not condemn either group. In other words, he accepted their ittijad and in independent reasoning of both groups and did not blame either one. The Sahaba learned to respect and accept more than one opinion. This hadith teaches us many impact, important lessons that our Imams will further elaborate on, inshallah. And so uh, the actors, I think they deserve a little a quick little round of applause. They've been asked to play in many movies, but they decline all of them just for this one. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that comic relief. Um, we're going to go ahead and get back on schedule and uh, introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Ihab. He is currently 
a uh, UNCC professor teaching computer science and has years of studying Akhida. Choose to turn to the stage. So, how long have you had? 15 minutes. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف خلق الله المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن سار على خطاه واتبع هداه إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته All praises are to Allah سبحانه وتعالى We seek the help and the refuge from the evils of our souls and the evils of our deeds When Allah سبحانه وتعالى guides none can misguide him And when Allah سبحانه وتعالى misguides None can guide him. I bear witness that there is no God worth to be worshipped except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his servant and his last messenger. So I keep, inshallah, 10 minutes watching my watch here. I'm honored to be here. Uh, and I would like first, before I start, and I hope it will not be counted from my seconds, because to thank the brothers who made this event to, uh, together. And I, I, I was honored to be with them in the organization meeting. And I, I felt that this is the kind of youth that we would like to have in our community to work together for something that brings the community together as unity. And I would like to thank the imams and thank you. Without you coming here, we will not have a program. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you and reward you. I would like to share for these 10 minutes something uh, from my own experience because this is a topic uh, that was a concern uh, uh, in my uh, heart and in my mind for all my years since I was a youth. And by the way, I'm not youth now. So, so uh, I, uh, I was really uh, uh, seeking knowledge for uh, answering these important questions. Unity is for us is very important. And this topic is, 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 uh, is a big topic. So we have to admit that it's not a one hour topic. But Maybe raising the issues will be enough to start uh, be more aware about this topic and how to practice it in this life. First, I would like to clarify some issues about the title. So, uh, agree to disagree. It really means agree to understand our disagreement, not agree to be divided. Okay? So, I think. I don't want anybody to have misunderstanding of this because some, many people talk to me about it. What does it mean? Should we agree to disagree? Means we agree to have this. It, it's agree to accept our disagreement sometimes when disagreements are acceptable. So that's basically important point here to understand the theme of all uh, the uh, imams will, will be talking about afterwards. This is not a new topic and this is not a new issue. This issue has been raised and was an issue for Muslims all, for all years, for all the history of Muslims. Since the time of the Prophet وسلم, and the da'wah in Mecca and Medina, until our time. And there has been lots of books, and if you are interested, I have a bag of books that collected from my humble library to show you that this topic is, has been addressed. And we just need to read. As Muslims, we just need to research things. We just need to leverage the heritage that we inherited from all these great scholars. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we don't have to rethink our ways because it has been well researched for many years. And there's one important issue here. There's a difference between khilaf and ikhtilaf. In Arabic, we have these two words. Unfortunately, we don't have this uh, 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 elegant Synonyms like this khilaf, ikhtilaf, you think it's the same, they are not the same. There's a, there's a letter ta, the difference between them. So we can be different, but we don't have to be divided. Ikhtilaf means divided. And khilaf means different. Can we, can we, be, can we have and can we adopt different opinion? And at the same time, uh, we are not divided. That's the crucial question that every one individual and should be asking. Uh, and the answer is yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made unity is a sole responsibility for every individual in Muslim Ummah, as well as 
the imams, greater responsibility on them, as well as the leaders, much greater responsibility among them to unite this ummah. It's not less important than the salat, than the siyam, than the hajj and anything else. Because Muslim, Muslims were created to be united. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in many ayats, and I will just want to quote some of them. وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا In another ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ إِنَّ هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ Your ummah, your nation is a one ummah. It's a ummah to tawheed. We are not 500 ummahs. We are not 506. We are one ummah. If we have tawheed our basis, we are one ummah. Also the ayat that has been recited. Beautiful starting for the meeting. وَاَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this ayah He's given us the order in what we should do and the order in what we should not do and he makes this wonderful correlation and connection between them He wants to tell us do not divide them among yourself do not divide among yourself but he did not say he, you don't divide among yourself, but he gave us the cure just right there in the ayah. Hold tight in the robe of Allah. Hold tight in the robe of Allah so you will not be divided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show, show us the way. Show us the way not to be divided. If we hold tight on the robe of Allah, what's a robe of Allah? Al Quran is Sunnah. Al Quran, the authentic Sunnah. If we have our sources solely dependent on the Quran and the Sunnah, our life centered about the Quran and the Sunnah, most of our differences, most of our major differences will go away and we will be, we will be united. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also said in another ayah, In الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شيء. Those who divide themselves or they divide their, their deens and they become sect, they divide their deen among themselves and they become sects less than whom be shy you are not from them ya muhammad you are not from them those people who use the deen to interrogate and create this division where division is not allowed you are not from them ya muhammad so from this ayat and i just took simple examples a few examples we know how important this topic is and we know that why Muslims have added this topic all years long. So, there are many stories. And these stories are one of them that, that has been demonstrated in front of you, brothers and sisters, to show that the Sahaba had incidents of different opinion in fiqh. And there are many other incidents that I'm not going to talk about what you have seen here because that's so, so, so clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then they come to Medina, approve both opinions. Why? Because in the command of the Prophet ﷺ, there is a flexibility. When the Prophet ﷺ gave the command, don't pray Asr until you reach Bani Quraida, there is a possibility and there is a flexibility of two interpretation. That speed up until you reach Bani Quraida so you can pray Asr there. That's one. The other one, no, do not literally. The, the people have taken literally. Do not do it until you reach Bani Quraida. If you don't, then you can pray, you, you should delay it until you reach there. So those two understandings are legitimate based on Arabic language from that delay. Therefore, these different opinions should not lead to division. This is khilaf, but not ikhtilaf. And there are many different stories from the same, uh, from the same type. And 10 minutes or even one hour will not be enough to go over them, but I think that the key point has been communicated here from this hadith. Al Imam Malik, rahimahullah, when he was asked to make his book, Al Muwatta, to be the standard fiqh book in all countries, in all states, in all states at that time, because we have one country, the Muslim country, uh, he refused to do so. And he said, no, because there are many different fiqhs, and the Sahaba went to many different directions. And everybody has his own interpretation. I don't want to enforce my opinion on all other opinions. This is an example that came after the Prophet ﷺ time. Now, pitfalls and misconceptions. This is what I would like to, con to, con to conclude with. Where all old ayat and the hadith shows clearly that we have no option except to be united. And those who ignore unity or put the unity down in his agenda 
Wallah, he will be responsible in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is neglecting other ibadah because this is a full important soul ibadah. But at the meantime, we have to understand that division sometimes affects, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said in the hadith, that the short version of the hadith that this ummah will be divided into 73 sects. So we cannot bang our head on the, on the wall. We have to understand that there are differences we cannot cope up with. And there are differences that we cannot compromise with. Otherwise, the Prophet Sallallahu would have made a better compromise with the Kuffar Quraysh when they offer him to worship his God one day and he worship their God another day. There is a matter of Aqeedah that we cannot compromise. And if there's division in that matters, let it happen. Because we cannot give up our religion and dilute our Aqeedah and our foundations because we want to come together. This is not the point. And it will never be the point of anyone here in the panelists. The point here is to understand where we, our khilaf will be legitimate and where our khilaf will not be legitimate and we have to stand firm in our foundation and say that's the way. And that's what called Hablullah, the robe of Allah. And if you don't tie it on that, if you hold tight in the robe, you want to hold tight in another robe, be by yourself. But the robe of Quran and Sunnah is the robe that we will unite us. And unfortunately, Muslims, I want to conclude with this statement, that many of these uh, divisions among Muslims are superficial and not real and not, you know, a matter of aqidah, but they are a matter of personal conflict sometimes and sometimes a matter of different schools or of thought. We need to learn to listen to each other and we need to know how to establish a constructive dialogue. And for that, we can bridge that differences. And with this, we can, inshallah, be united, understanding the framework and the, the framework of unity where we can be united and where we can, inshallah, be together and where we have to protect our deen by saying, no, that's our foundation and we have to stand firm. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and give us the enlightenment in our head and in our heart to follow his sunnah and to follow the Quran and the sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite this ummah by loving him and upon following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'll call you this and astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Jazakumullah khairan. Sorry for taking one more minute. Um, just a few announcements, uh, brothers and sisters, we have some people that are wearing the teal badges um, and they are our volunteers tonight. Um, on, the, on the subject of questions, um, no cards have been passed out along with pens. Um, as you hear uh, some of the things that the imams are saying, if you do have a question about those, um, feel free to write them down um, and pass them down to the end so that an usher could take it. Um, also, uh, if you would like to um, clarify or um, ask a specific imam to answer a question, make sure to note that as well. Um, and if I could ask uh, the brothers and sisters so that when more people come in, um, they don't have to walk across you, just kind of gravitate towards um, the left, the sisters, and the right, the brothers. And if, if families want to sit together, um, leave some space for them in the center to sit. Um, so uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our second speaker, uh, Brother Shamuddin, um, who is a Muslim who loves Allah, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, Muslims, and all of Allah's creations as we all do. To the stage. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa ba'd. I was asked to talk about the differences amongst the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how they resolved those differences. The companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who are not immune to differing. It is the nature of the human being, the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him, that we are different in everything. We are different in the way we look, the way we think, the way we behave, in our priorities, 
We are different in our languages that we speak, in our colors, our cultures. Therefore, it's not strange then that we should find that we have differences in our opinion, in the way we interpret things and the way we implement things, our methodology towards accomplishing a goal. So the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam differed like anyone else would differ. But if you were to look at their history, there were two distinct phases in time. The first, he's putting up a fight. <laughs> the first was the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the second, the time after him. So if you look at the companions and their differences in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how they handled those differences, it was different from the time after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when I mean after his time, I mean after his passing. So you find in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions when they differed, in fact I wanted to say something before that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stated in Quran, He said, وَمَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ And whatever you differ in, in anything, then its decision is with Allah. You have to return to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also commanded us in Quran when He said, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ فَإِن تَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ That all believers obey Allah and obey Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and those who have authority amongst you. And if you dispute concerning something, then return it to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if you truly are believers or if you truly believe in Allah in the last day. That is better for you and the best interpretation or would bring the best outcome for your differences. So you find the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his time when they differ they would go back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and tell him what happened, what transpired, and get the interpretation from him. And we have this example here that was acted out, uh, not precisely because there was stuff there that was said that didn't really happen. The companions of the Prophet ﷺ never shook hands and said they'll agree to disagree. They didn't do that. They just went about their business according to the hadith narrated by Al-Bukhari and Muslim, and other than the two, they went about their, this, their, their affairs, they completed their mission that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent them on. And then when they returned to al Madina, then is when they, they disputed the matter and they took the dispute to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, this is what transpired. That when we were traveling, <coughs> the time for us came and this group decided they're going to do us and the other group didn't want to do salat al us. Because you said until we arrive at Bani Quraitha and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hadith, it didn't say what he did. So he didn't say that both of them, that they're correct. I like to be precise in narration of the hadith. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, according to the hadith, it says, فَلَمْ يُعَنِّفْ وَاحِدًا مِنْهُمْ He did not say that one of them was wrong. See that? But he didn't say both were right. And that's very important for us to remember. Sometimes that you may be with people and they may do something and it may not necessarily be wrong but it doesn't have to be right either. And you let them do what they have to do. You don't have to fight over everything. You go back to Allah and go back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So you find in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the companions, one of the ways that they handled their differences, they would go back to him to resolve the difference. They wouldn't fight amongst themselves because he was amongst them and they were commanded to obey him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran, وَمَا آتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا 
Whatever the Prophet ﷺ give you, take it. And whatever he forbid you from doing, then refrain from doing it. So when the companions were with Rasulullah ﷺ, there was no dispute. If they were to dispute, they go to the Prophet ﷺ, and he would resolve the issue. You find, for instance, we have, another ex we have many examples. But take another example, for example, Salman al-Farisi and Abu Darda. And I'm quite sure most people know this story, that when the Prophet ﷺ migrated from Mecca to al Madinah, he made brothers between the Ansar and the Muhajireen. Amongst the, Muhaj amongst the Muhajireen are one who was considered a Muhajir was Salman al-Farisi. Even though he wasn't originally from Mecca, he wasn't from al Madinah. Therefore, he was considered Muhajir. He was made brother to Abu Darda. And Abu Darda was, was I'm sorry. So one day Salman al-Farisi visited Abu Darda and they disputed about a few things. The gist of it is Abu Darda wanted to do salah pretty much the whole night and Salman al-Farisi said, no, we need to sleep. Uh, he was fasting and he told Salman to eat and he didn't eat and Salman said, so Abu Darda said, what is this? I'm fasting. So he broke his fast and he ate with Salman al-Farisi. And the next morning, that's after the prayer, after the night, uh, or later in the morning, Salman al-Farisi woke up and did Salat al-Tahajjud and he woke Abu Darda and told him to pray with me also. And then in the morning, Abu Darda went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam listened to Abu Darda and he said, Sadaqa Salman. So you find that the way the Prophet the companions of the Prophet وسلم, resolved their difference in his time were to return to him, which is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to do. And if we were to do that, you'd find our differences would remain slim or small. We wouldn't differ in the things that really matter. The second thing that's important about, I'm going to just rush through this. The second thing that was important about the companions of the Prophet وسلم, the way they resolved their differences is they would follow the leader. So especially in the time after Rasulullah I'm just rushing through this, they would always follow the leader. Because that is command in Quran. Allah says, فَرُدُّوهُ إِلَىٰ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُوا الرَّسُولَ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ and follow also, obey Allah and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those who have authority amongst you. So they would always follow Amirul Mu'mineen. So you find in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar ibn Khattab that there were very minimal differences amongst the companions. Not in major matter. Why? Because they would follow Abu Bakr and follow Umar There was differences after. And my belief is that in the time when there was huge conflicts between the companions, what is called the time of fitna, it wasn't because of differences amongst the companions themselves. It was people who were enemies of Islam who wanted to cause conflicts amongst the Muslims and destroy the unity of the Muslims. There are two things, at least two things, if we were to do, it would minimize our differences and these are the two things or two of the things that the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did. The first is return to Quran and Sunnah. If we differ, it is what Allah has commanded us to do. And if we really have taqwa and we really want the truth and we want to obey Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu we'd listen. We wouldn't say we have all the truth. We would listen to someone and we'll return to the Quran and Sunnah and ask the people of knowledge. And the second thing, we would follow the authority. Unfortunately, give me, give me 30 seconds, inshallah. <laughs> we don't have Khalifa. We don't have a single authority as Muslims that we are compelled to follow. You find we differ in many of the communities here in, in the United States and even in Charlotte amongst ourselves because we're not obligated to follow anyone. We didn't make bay'ah to anybody for sam'ah and ta'ah. See that in good times and bad times that we will listen and we will obey. Hence we will differ, we will continue to differ. It is how we handle those differences. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He let us realize that we will continue to differ but that despite our differences, we will put the best interests of Islam and the Muslims 
foremost, in front of our personal self. Emilia Rapalani, me, Mrs. Our third speaker tonight, inshallah, we'll have uh, Imam Khalil. Um, he's currently a resident at the resident Imam at Masjid al Shahid and has served in this capacity for the last 35 to 40 years. He also was a student of the late Imam W.D. Muhammad. Recently retired um, from the Department of Public Safety as their clinical chaplain and currently is serving as the adjunct chaplain at Johnson C. Smith University. Um, introducing to the stage, Imam Khalid. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Nasta'inahu wa nasta'rufilhu wa numinu bihi azul ajalna. Ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ali alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amabai. That is, praise be to Allah, the Lord of all world, all Lord of all systems of knowledge, we ask his help, we seek his protection, we believe in him, we put our complete trust in him, mighty and sublime as he. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, he has no partners, no associates. And I bear witness that Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prayers and the peace be upon him, is his servant and his messenger. Peace be upon him and upon his companions, his descendants, the righteous all, and upon you, O Muslim, be peace in what follows this salutation. I want to commend our young brothers for the job that they've done to bring us all together in this forum. I think it's a very important occasion and, and the beginning of something that's very good. We're talking tonight on Muslim unity, how do we unify, and also how do we work together. Allah Most High addresses the subject of unity in the Quran in a short surah, four verses, in surah that we call Surah to Ikhlas. Ikhlas translated as purity. And Allah says in that surah, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say he, Allah, is the one and only. Allah has summit. Allah is eternal and absolute. That means he has no needs from his creation. He was never born. And he, and he never dies. Always have existed. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Lam yulid wa lam yulad. And lam, he, that means that he was never, never in need of a female consort, a female companion to produce life. Lam is a very strong word. It means a negative impossibility. And it's imperfect. That means it didn't happen in the past. It didn't happen, it's not happening in the present, nor is it going to happen in the future. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakullahu kufu wa nahed. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there's nothing existing comparable or comparable unto him, the one and only. So unity for Muslim is possible only on the basis of Tawheed. That is the belief that Allah is one with no partners or associates. And this oneness is borne out by creation itself as a sign of the one Lord who evolved it. The material realm is the same as all material realm, whether it is in our galaxy, the Milky Way, or in galaxies a billion light years away it is held together by one material system. This is Tawheed, and a witness to the oneness of, of Allah. Now, if Allah is one, and his creation is one, and we are part of that creation, then it stands to reason that we, who are Allah's creation, is one humanity. Thus, Allah Most High says in the Quran, he says, Qat karamdi kuli bani Adam. Qat karamdi bani Adam. So we have certainly created the children of Adam, and gave, we have certainly give, given every child of Adam uh, nobility. So it doesn't say that this nobility is just for one of us, or one group of us. 
it says that this nobility is for all of the children of Adam, and all of us are children of Adam. So we have equal dignity, and this is what our Lord is saying to us, that he wants, to, he desires for us to have equal dignity because he create, created us such, as such. Now imagine if this was taught in our, and practiced in our institutions, starting first with our families, then in our schools, then in our religious institution, including the masjid. The words of the Quran is more powerful, is more powerful for eliminating racism and sexism and all the other kind of negativisms. Social problems exist when social ideas are in conflict with social reality. In other words, if we preach gender equality, but we're practicing something else. If we say that race and all of this does not matter, but the reality that we are living in conflicts with that. They, that is a paradox. And a paradox is when something conflicts. You're saying one thing, but you're doing another. This is a challenge to all of us who are Muslims. Tawheed addresses race consciousness and lets us know that these differences, though they are important, should not be a cause for us to miss what is most important for the human being, which is his, his humanity. Allah highly glorified, he says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nasu, inna khalaqanakum min dhakarin wa anta, wa ja'anakum shu'uban, wa kaba'ila lita'arafu. Inna akramakum inna allahi atakakum, inna allaha alimun. Kabir. That is, all mankind, all people, we have created you from a male and a female and made you into nations and tribes that you may lead to our food, get to know one another. So this is something that Allah is telling us. He's letting us know by virtue of coming from one man and one woman, one female and one man, and, and descending from that, from that that we have spread out into the earth and we've gone into different environments. And because of those different environments, we have developed differences, different languages, different cultures. Even our taste buds are different. You know when we come together at the Eid and we, if we do, we eat each other's food, our taste buds are even different. But these differences were not allowed to develop by Allah Most High so that we may learn to hate each other. No, it's a little out of food. So that we may learn, learn to, we may get to know each other. So in that statement, we see a challenge. A challenge to each and every one of us. That we have to, our social consciousness, have to expand beyond our own narrow interests and concerns until it becomes big enough, big enough for me to embrace you and for you to embrace me. For me to embrace my African brother, my European brother, my Asian brother. For me and you and I to embrace human beings, no matter where they come from. And we can do that by embracing our common humanity. Uh oh, we're getting late. Three minutes. Furthermore, we learned that from this revelation that none of us can claim superiority based on gender, on national origin, or travel affiliation. The only basis for superiority in which, is which of us have the most taqwa. In the Prophet Wasallam last address to the people, he said there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab and vice versa. Of a black, of a white, or a red, metal, or a white, however you want to translate that, and vice versa. Reiterating the revelation from the Quran, he said that the best of you are the one who are most regardful. This tells us that the humanity is more important for us than racial classification. If we lose our sense of belonging to a race, tribe, or nation, as long as we retain and appreciate our humanity and grow in human excellence, we will be progressing. We can have and cherish racial identity along with great race pride, but if we slip from the foundation of our true humanity, all that we accomplish as a race-conscious people would not amount to real progress. The journey will be painful and disappointing. This is Tawheed. This is the unity that Allah wants us to see. And the diversity makes movement for the unity which is encompassing. The unity, the unity encompasses all diversity. And the diversity is created by God. So there will be movement and not a complacent static life without movement. 
Emotional cries for unity won't bring us together. Traditional dress or rituals will not bring us together. Even attending the same messages, sitting on the same prayer rug, will not bring us together. If we have to work in harmony together, it has to be based on taqwa and a sacred respect for each other and the past that brought us to El Islam. Those of us who are followers of Imam W.D. Muhammad, students of Imam W.D. Muhammad, respect the classical scholars, but we have equal respect for the contemporary scholarship of Imam W.D. Muhammad. But we do not accept that if you're not Hanafi and Shafia and Maliki and Hanbali, you are not true Muslim. These Imam, may Allah be pleased with them, were great, but they weren't infallible. They did not extract all of the knowledge that's in the Quran and the life example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we are to agree to disagree, let's begin with mutual respect for each other. Assalamu alaikum. We uh, thank you for uh, passing up the questions. The questions are um, written in uh, um, very nice handwriting now, so we are able to read them. We thank you. Um, I remind you, uh, if you have questions specific to the topic that the, that the speakers have, have spoken on, uh, we welcome those. And also, if you have questions outside of the scope of, uh, of, uh, of, of what we're talking about today, but also relating to Islam, uh, please feel free to uh, send those up. We have some very, very um, good questions uh, for our second session um, after the two events. Uh, introducing our fourth speaker, um, Imam Yahya Abdullah, our guest from Dallas, Texas. Um, he's the resident Imam in Dallas, Texas, and has served um, in this position for the last 30 years. He's a personal friend of uh, Imam, Khalil, uh, Imam Khalil, a student and business partner um, of the Imam W.D. Muhammad. He is also a well-known national and international speaker on Al-Islam, introducing to the floor Imam Yahya Abdullah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasul al-Kareem. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, to my good friend Imam Khalil Akbar, uh, I'm, I'm just pleased to be here. I'm here for a program with the community, Masjid al Shaheed. And uh, Imam Khalil said, well, we're having this program on unity uh, with the Muslims. I said, well, I have to be a part of that. We're all, we're all one community. And I brought with me, I want to show you something, and I shared this with uh, our brother earlier, that now someone emailed me this today, uh, before this occasion. This is held, the first one of these were held uh, Thursday in Houston, Texas. So the Muslims with the Ahmadiyya community, the Sunni, the Shi'i, Imam W.D. Muhammad community, they met at the Bonu Center in Houston, and it says here, Muslims talk with Muslims a successful outcome. So yeah, we're two days after this. Now I'm going to, uh, we have uh, learned Imams and uh, learned scholars here today. But I want to share with you something from a personal experience that I had in Saudi Arabia in 1990. And we were visiting, we were on a trip with Imam Walakuddin Muhammad. Uh, we were guests of the government of Saudi Arabia at that time. We were on a state visit. And one of the great privileges we had was to visit with the late Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz, Sheikh Al Sheikh, they call him. May God forgive him his sins and grant him paradise. Yes, I've had the honor of sitting in the home of Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Baz's house on two occasions and eating with him. Very scholarly 
Muslim leader that was respected by the world, the entire Muslim world. Imam Wafidi Muhammad asked him a question and he said to him, Your Excellency Sheikh Abdul Aziz bin Bass, we American Muslims from the United States of America, what madhab, school of thought, should we accept and should we follow in the United States of America? And Sheikh bin Bass, I hope you don't mind me imitating him a little bit. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> he says, Ma madhab. <laughs> you already ever heard it, that's how he spoke. La madhab fi America. No madhabs in America. He says, Halantum America. You all are Americans. Study the Quran for yourself. Study the life of Muhammad the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for yourself. And apply it to your peculiar, unique circumstances in America. He says, follow none of them. And he says, I, Ben Bass, has no madhab. Don't follow mine either. <laughs> and uh, Dr. Imad was referring to that earlier. That we are not forced to accept the uh, opinions, the tafsir, of any of our learned imams, may God grant them all paradise, and I'm sure they're in paradise. They were wonderful servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of them, the great ones who were at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those who came after. The great scholars that the world of Islam, that we as an international ummah has benefited from. And I have read them and I have studied them. But we do them an injustice. We, we do them an injustice if we ask them or refer to them to address issues and problems in the 21st century when they never lived in the 21st century. They were not, uh, I was watching, and I have mine, I left it. I have a smartphone with the Quran on it also. I have my smartphone. He have iPads, the technology, the internet. No, no, none of them ever had these tools. And now we have Shape Google. You can go to Shape Google and pretty much answer any question you want to shop. <laughs> That's true. You just have to be careful what it is you, you, you read now. You have to have some basis in the religion. Because Shape Google will just give you everybody's opinion. Some good, some bad. So you have to be careful. But their ideas were for the time that they lived in. The only thing that we as Muslims that has no time barriers for us as Muslims is the Word of God, the Quran, and the Uswa. I could have said Sunnah. I said the Uswa. The example of Muhammad the Prophet That it, time does not erase that. And as uh, our doctor said of our Aqidah, it is not restricted by time. So we look different. And Imam Khalil Akbar from the Quran, he said that God made us this way. That's a long vow. Yeah, because it means to elevate us socially. And you should hear out of fact in that. That when the Muslims from every nation, every group, every culture go for the Hajj or the Umrah, but particularly on the Hajj, and ascend to the plains of Arafat, I've been there many times, alhamdulillah, ascend to the plains of Arafat, every leader from around the globe, from Malaysia, from Guyana, from Egypt, from Pakistan, from Kenya, from Saudi Arabia, from Nigeria, and oh yes, now from the United States of America. Yeah! Now from the indigenous Muslims, we are indigenous. And let me say this as I conclude. I didn't learn my Islam in Arabia. No harm there. I didn't learn it in Egypt. I didn't learn it in Pakistan. I learned it in the neighborhoods of the United States of America from Imam Wadi through the Imam. Yes. So now we have Allahu Akbar. And I learned it 
After coming out of Christianity, my father was a reverend, Reverend John Brown. I grew up in the Baptist church until I was 18 years old in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm a kind of Carolinian. I was born actually in Charleston, South Carolina. But I grew up in the Baptist church as most of us who are converts to Al-Islam in America. And I will say this as I conclude. We in America, the African American community here, we can help you, our brothers from overseas and our sisters from overseas. You need us because we know America genetically. Yeah, you hear what I said? We know America genetically in our genes. And we need you. We need your knowledge. We need your culture. We need those traditions. We need that information that you have from your land. And together, we in America, America has had a history of race, but look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is changing America, bringing all of the Muslims from all the world. And now, the, the, the Muslims, they fight overseas, different group. But they come to America, they can live right next door to each other, nobody fights. They just greet each other right next door. <laughs> this is the land. This is the last place. So now that we're all here, let us show the rest of America the true meaning of one humanity, one God, one creation. And let us not try to impose our cup. And I like Bakalawi. <laughs> I like hummus, hummus, I love it. <laughs> but I also love some barbecue chicken. <laughs> I'd like to say I like barbecue chicken too. <laughs> we were supposed to be done with the uh, with the guest speakers at 8 o'clock, and it is now 8.04, so Imam Yahya Edirur, I apologize, but we won't have, uh, and he's not paying attention to my joke, so let me introduce him. <laughs> imam Yahya Edirur, the resident imam at Mass Charlotte, uh, has been the imam there for two years. He has been imams in other cities as well. He possesses a degree from the Islamic American University and has spent over six years um, in extensive traditional study circles under many renowned scholars overseas. Now introducing um, Imam Yahya Eder. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala al-mab'uthi rahmatan al-alameen wa ala ahli wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I would definitely like to reiterate um, giving my thanks and our thanks that we should all give to the sisters and the brothers that organized this uh, amazing event in which you see all kinds of people from many different backgrounds and masajid coming together here in a forum in which we can unify ourselves recognizing the beauty of the richness of Islam. And so that was uh, what they asked me to talk about. And um, it really, it starts um, in understanding why there's differences in the first place. Um, some people would believe that Islam was sent to make a robotic uh, people that would have this way of thinking and there would be no if, ands, or buts, and a very narrow, that's the way it is, and there's no exceptions to this way. And that's just not uh, what it was. That's not what any scholar in the history of Islam understand. That is not what we see when we look at the giant sea, uh, an ocean of resources, of scholarly literature that go back 14 centuries that we could very easily fill a hundred rooms like this size with. Books written by the scholars who lived their life and traveled across the world and soaked up knowledge and thought about it with depth of analysis, with a spiritual engagement and so forth. So it began when the Sahaba radiallahu ta'anhum ajma'in, they all traveled across the world to try to spread the message of Islam. And most all of them memorize a large part, if not the whole entire Qur'an. Many of them have soaked up hundreds and hundreds of hadith from the Prophet And so they went where they went. 
And so they developed students. And obviously, as the Sheikh so well put it, there was not a mass media age back then. So basically, there was no Sheikh Google, there was Sheikh uh, um, uh, Abu Musa al Ash'ari, there was Sheikh Mu'adh al Jabal, there was Sheikh Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhum ajma'in. There are many different scholars, and the people would sit with them, and it is a historic tradition that. Um, has many times been properly applied and many times been exaggerated and maybe misapplied in respecting the people of knowledge and the elders and those who have um, experience above us. And as Sheikh Shem Din said, we should never allow that to um, put us in a position where we are reading Quran and Sunnah and feeling very comfortable with something and we're willing to follow a Sheikh when we don't see what they're saying in what we have in the Quran and the Sunnah. This would be a problem. This would be a disconnect from our foundational resource. So what happened in a nutshell, because we have a very short amount of time, is that when you see the development of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, Abu al-Fuqaha, as some of the scholars call him, the father of the jurists of the history of Islam. He came a few, uh, a few decades after the Prophet ﷺ he was born, and some 70 years after the Prophet ﷺ he developed a methodology of codifying Islamic law. And he was a genius, philosophically speaking, and he developed um, an amazing relationship between Quranic objectives and principles and foundations, hadiths, and then in dealing with the new realities that they were facing in that Persian area that he was from, in Iraq. Uh, Iraq historically was, was Persia, and they did not speak Arabic. As a matter of fact, some of Abu Hanifa's uh, grandparents and so forth were Persian, and there were many people speaking Persian back then there. And so Imam Malik, Imam Dar al-Hijrah, he is in Medina, and he comes uh, close to a, a century after the Prophet ﷺ. And he took from all of the great-grandchildren of the companions, and so he developed and codified a system in his uh, beautiful treatise called Al-Muwatta. And Al-Muwatta is basically establishing a codified legislation according to all of the narrations that he had, which are hundreds and hundreds uh, in a codified system. And so then later after that, you have this genius young kid uh, whose family was from Gaza and he was born and raised in Mecca, Imam Abdullah ibn Idris al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu radiallahu anhu ardahum ajma'in. He comes up in Mecca and he's now challenging as a 14-year-old the scholars of Mecca. And this was an amazing precedent in history. And so then he went to Imam Malik, who was in his 60s, when he's about 20 years old, and he starts challenging Imam Malik, his sheikh, changing the mentality of whatever our sheikh said is unquestionable material. You see, that was part of the Salaf al-Salih. This is the Tabi Tabi'in we're talking about here within that realm. And so then you have Imam Ahmed uh, ibn Hanbal, who came up as well from Baghdad, and then he traveled around, and he was really focused for some time time with Imam Abu Yusuf al-Hanafi Qadi al qudā which was one of the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. Believe it or not, Hanbali fiqh is very much usuli oriented within Abu Hanifa's tradition. But then he met Imam Shafi and took him for a teacher and he gathered the thousands and thousands, some say oh, hundreds of thousands of hadith and he has the largest collection of hadith Imam Ahmad uh, so now, let me give you an understanding of why they have differing opinions. Because Imam Ahmad differed with Imam Shafi, who was his sheikh, right? That was his sheikh that he learned from for many, many years. And so they differed. Why? It's something called usul. You have to understand this term, and as the common Muslim, it should never be that we don't understand what the word usul means. If you know what the word fiqh means, then next you should definitely um, consequentially learn the word usul. Fiqh, to understand a juristic reality from the Quran and the Sunnah as interpreted by the early generations and those who followed them, right? Usul is the methodology of deriving uh, how do we get at a ruling? And they differed about how that practice happens. So you have Imam Abu Hanifa who has certain usul, certain principles that he follows that he will make his ruling from. 
Imam Malik has different usul. And I'll give you one example. For example, Imam Abu Hanifa was in a time where there was a lot of fitna of fabricating many hadith. And he had a very strict system for accepting hadith as a result. So he had a golden chain that he followed that went through Masruq and Abdullah uh, and Nakhai Masruq Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhum. And so he was very comfortable with that and a lot of what he says comes from that root and much of it goes back to Umar and Ali radiallahu anhum al Khulafa al Rashidin. And so he he felt very comfortable within that, but he has also an opinion called Ashab al Ra'i that he felt we should use the overall objectives and principles found in the Quran and the Sunnah when we don't have a text that is clear and decisive, we use that to uh, try to arrive at rulings. So Imam Abu Hanifa developed some rulings based upon principled opinion. Imam Malik, because he is studying from the grandchildren of the companions and there's so much more authentic hadith available, he was the Imam of Madrasat al Athar or Madrasat al Hadith. That he was uh, basically the founder of the um, narration based school and he was very careful ever to leave the clear cut narration standard. But he preferred something called, Zakallah khair, he preferred something called Amal uh, Ahl uh, al Medina. And this is something nobody else has. He said the people of Medina are the grandchildren of the companions of the Prophet. So what they thought together must be high qualified revelation based understanding. So for example, there's a famous example that many of you might, this is, I'm just telling you the method as it's written, okay? Don't accuse me of anything. I've gone through this for two years now, okay? So for example, you all know the hadith about the dog's saliva, right? So that hadith is authentic. You know, the dog saliva, if it licked in your bowl and so forth and so forth, they made this opinion that the saliva of the dog is najis and so forth. Imam Malik said, no, it's not najis. And he used a vague verse from the Quran about a hunting dog. And then he said, the amal of Ahl al-Medina, the grandchildren of the Prophet ﷺ and his companions did not see that ruling, right? That was a hadith that went somewhere else and we did not have that. So he preferred their understanding over there. And now everybody's like, I can get a dog, right? <laughs> That's maybe a subject we can open up some other time, inshallah. <laughs> but I'm just telling you principles, right? Imam Shafi'i really was taking a hodgepodge of everything, but because of his insight and genius, he was pretty much someone that very much was trying to gather between Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik school. Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, he was very much into hadith and he had so much prevalence to hadith, he also took, believe it or not, Imam Ahmad was much more loose on the hadith in his school of thought than Imam Abu Hanifa. Many people have it mixed up and think it's the other way around. And so he said the da'if hadith would be more better to me than the opinion of someone else. So he would take a weak hadith. So I'm just giving you a, basically a surface value of there are something called usul. How a scholar from linguistic connotations, the theoretical principle, juristic, legal theory that they have developed or that they follow, that they are teaching. And you have many other scholars that came later, al Thawri and al Uzai and Imam Ibn Hazm, Imam Ibn Dawood. You have, if you go to Al Azhar and you study in Dar al Ifta, they will tell you you have to learn 90 madhabs. 90. 90 madhabs. Because why our history is that rich. So I want to leave you because we have one minute with a couple of statements. And these statements are telling you about the richness of Islam and confirming what the brother said here. That you're going to follow what you feel is most comfortable. It's in the Quran and Sunnah. It comes from a qualified scholar. And it suits your setting. It makes your life uh, simplistic. Why? Because the Quran said that. مَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ he never made in your practice of religion hardship. He wants for you ease and not hardship. And the Prophet says, Yassiru wala tu'assiru, bashiru wala tunafiru. These are Bukhari. This is a lot of people think the religion is supposed to be strict and hard and all of this. These are hadith and ayahs from the Quran and Sunnah in which the Prophet said, facilitate things, don't make them difficult on people. He said, give people glad tidings and don't alienate them with harsh um, judgments and so forth. So this is the Prophet So one of our great scholars, al numan one of the sages of our history, he said, ma ba, ma ulul fatwa yuftun. That the reality is the people in our history that give legal, juristic opinions and edicts, they're going to do that. فَيُحِلُّ هَذَا وَيُحَرِّمُ هَذَا Someone's going to say about something that's halal and someone's going to say that that is haram. فَلَا يَرَى الْمُحِلُّ 
ta'lu anna al-muharrima qad halaka li tahrimihi and it would never be that the person of the scholar that said it was permissible would see that the person who prohibited it is done some terrible thing and destroyed himself since he prohibited it and vice versa that the one who uh, saw something as prohibited would not look at the scholar or the person who's following that saw that as permissible and say oh that person has lost their deen and all of that this is one of the great scholars in our history so uh, I will leave you with what uh, Al Mar'i, one of our great scholars, Mashaykh Al Hanabala, said. He says, Al Ikhtilaf fi hadi al Umma rahmatan kabira wa ni'matan azima. That the differences in this Umma are a huge mercy and they are a big blessing upon us. Adrakahu al Alimun wa Amiya alayhi al Jahilun. And this reality was understood by the people of knowledge and the ignorant folks are going to go around attacking each other and causing problems, not recognizing the beauty and the richness of the deen of Islam. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa alam. Jazakumullah khairan. Thank you, Imam Yahya, for those words. Um, I'd like to uh, bring back to the stage Sister Rasha to explain to you um, all a little bit about um, what we're trying to do um, <laughs> with the Charlotte Muslim Forum. Assalamualaikum. I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time because we have uh, esteemed scholars here and I'm not worthy of speaking in front of them, so forgive me for any mistakes. Um, I was uh, looked up ikhtilaf in Wikipedia real quickly, and I know I really shouldn't be doing this in front of scholars, because <laughs> we're not supposed to be Googling our faith, but I found, <laughs> I found it really interesting uh, that ikhtilaf means disagreement, um, and it's defined as Islamic scholarly religious disagreement. And it's, uh, underneath it, the paragraph says, Islam teaches that when there's a when there is a scholarly disagreement on a certain issue, it is impermissible to condemn a person who follows a position that is different from one's own. And I found, I found it so ironic that that is exactly what we are trying to do here, right? Um, and then what I found even more interesting, and wallahi, this is not scripted. I mean, this is, I've asked some, I was asked to do this and I just Googled. Um, underneath it, it uh, relays a prophetic tradition, and the scholars can elaborate. It says, underneath ikhtilaf, it says, uh, the differences of opinion, ikhtilaf, between the ummah are a blessing, a form of a blessing. And I believe there is a tradition that goes along that lines that the difference of opinion is actually a form of uh, a blessing. And subhanAllah, you know, when I see the crowd here of like, I don't know, what is it, over 200? Uh, folks that registered um, three months ago or maybe even a little bit before that a group of volunteers who are independent not associated with any particular masjid had a vision and when I see the audience here it really subhanAllah you know uh, brings chills to me to see that the vision actually became a reality thanks to all of you and thanks to the Imams and Allah says uh, I, I'm not sure if it's a tradition or it's a ayat but one who does not thank uh, the people does not thank Allah. And I want to take uh, just a minute to thank all the scholars, the ones that travel from afar and those near, uh, for coming together and actually modeling the prophetic tradition. Right? Because it's, it's, it's one thing when you Google or when you read, uh, but it's another when you see, uh, you know, the ulama, you see the scholars in your presence. And, and not only were they brave enough to come together, <coughs> But in the next half an hour, we're going to cream them by asking them questions. <laughs> so, subhanAllah, you know, I mean, that really, uh, please, please make special dua for, the, for, the, for everyone sitting up here. Uh, because they are very brave and bold uh, to answer all the questions that you have. And uh, just reiterating that again, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the moderator said this, but our goal, uh, and anyone that has a teal badge on, is really to help you, the community, to feel comfortable in asking questions that pertain to our faith, that means my faith, your faith, um, and to help us better understand who we are in the environment that we live in. Um, and to come together in a semi-sacred environment, right, where you feel comfortable, uh, where you're not going to be judged, uh, where you're more than welcome to ask whatever you'd like, and inshallah you get an answer that uh, would enhance your understanding of uh, Islam. 
And it's also to educate ourselves, to not just be tolerant. I don't like the word tolerance, because I think tolerance is a very, very uh, minimal, uh, it's a very minimal acceptance of one another. So I tolerate you as my brother in Islam. That's not enough. I think we need to embrace each other. Right? So I'm not going to ask you to do the next one now, which is just to shake your hands with your brother, because then you're going to ask me to stop talking. But please do that, you know? Shake hands, smiles, hug, uh, same gender, uh, <laughs> inshallah. And um, I'd like to just, lastly, before I leave, uh, just, we have an email address, uh, charlottemuslimforum at gmail.com. Feel free to write back to us. Uh, and subhanAllah, uh, you know, just whatever comments, if you think, if you go back home and you think about something, um, also, on the back of the card, we'd like future topics. Our goal is to do this on a quarterly basis, to do this, you know, inshallah, with tawfiq, uh, to do this every four months. We need topics. Uh, you know, so disagreeing, uh, agreeing on disagreeing was our first topic. I think someone suggested gender relations to be the next one. Uh, but whatever majority wants, inshallah, we will help, help to try to house that for you. Uh, so feel free to write that. And lastly, I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but there's one particular individual that's really been the backbone of this, who spent countless hours, uh, subhanAllah, you know, sending emails, messages, uh, trying to meet us up at Starbucks and Caribou and wherever, even in his house, uh, to just get together. He's very, very humble, and he, he's, not going to want, he's not going to like this, and I want to get in trouble for this. But Brother Osama Bayanuni is somewhere in the crowd, and please, uh, when you... If you, if you see him in passing, please just give him a pat on the back, make dua for him. Uh, you know, his wife is expecting Samia, so make dua for their children. Uh, inshallah, I said children, child, but inshallah. So please, uh, you know, please thank the volunteers. We're here for you. Whatever we can do to make you feel uh, more welcomed, please uh, approach us and uh, forgive us for our many, many shortcomings. Yeah. So my time is up. All right, we have a few uh, announcements about some events that are going to be going on in a couple months. Uh, Sister Sammy, you can start it off. Assalamu <laughs> Raise the hand. Who heard about the Puerto Vision Tour? Okay, mashallah, about half, a little less than half. So basically, uh, the Poetic Vision Tour is um, a bunch of artists who got together a few years ago, and it's a tour that goes around the whole U.S., and there are six famous artists, one of them are um, Dawood Warnsby, if you heard of him, uh, Ms. Latifah, Saad Omar, Jay Mecca, Raif, and Saad Muhammad. And they do deaf poetry, they do hip-hop, um, they do uh, poems, they do um, kawali, they do all these different things, and they're um, folk, uh, folk rock music. And they're all based on um, Islamic, Islamic things, Islamic inspirations. So they kind of turned, you know, this you know, hip hop generation into something Islamic that we can actually benefit from. So it's very nice. I've attended one in Florida before, and they're doing a spring tour, and they're touring 28 cities, and Charlotte is number one, uh, mashallah. So that's a good thing. So don't miss out. It's next Saturday, and it's going to be here at UNCC, but the McKnight Hall, mashallah. So next Saturday at seven o'clock at um, McKnight Hall. And to, to register, um, you just go on um, pvtcharlotte.eventbrite.com. And I'm going to hand out um, some of these, inshallah. So if you're going to get one, please get one from outside. As, as soon as you get out to the right, there, there's a bunch on the table. So hope to see you there, inshallah. And it's $10, but then it's going to go up to 12 or $15 after Monday. So make sure you register today or tomorrow, inshallah. That's about it. Um, an announcement that I'm going to give is, inshallah, after um, the question and answer, which we're going to jump straight into after a few announcements um, due to time, um, Imam uh, Yahya Abdullah has uh, um, been able to visit us, and in visiting us, he also has um, some CDs that cover the topic that we have discussed today, along with uh, many other topics that are very important and viable to Islam. So um, those will be for sale outside of... Uh, Outside of the uh, the area where we're going to get our drinks and concessions and whatnot, um, and uh, please make sure you check those out after our Q and A. Um, I want to uh, introduce uh, Brother Nada to tell you a little bit about um, the Amalri program that's coming soon. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. 
Can I get a quick raise of hand of who attended the first uh, al Maghrib class, which was in January? So about half the room again. Uh, basically, uh, uh, another group of volunteers worked very hard to bring this program here to Charlotte. There was a lot of people that used to travel all the way to Atlanta just to get the benefit of this class. And now that Charlotte is actually a Qabila, we're going to have a class here every uh, quarter, I believe. So our next class coming up is in April. It'll be the weekend of April 12th through the 14th. And we've got a lot of flyers out like this that are sitting outside. Uh, and if you can, on your way out, if you're interested, uh, the next class is by Sheikh Yasser Qadi, and it's on precious provisions, uh, basically the fit of food and clothing, uh, what's the difference between halal and what's the difference between zabiha and th that sort of thing. And he's going to get into the bare roots of uh, the subject. So we're going to have all the laptops outside for whoever would like to register on the spot. If you're not going to register, just make sure you grab one of these on your way out. Jazakumullah khair. All right, last but not least, uh, we have uh, another announcement. Yeah. You do? I got, I got you. You got it. I got you back. I got you back. <laughs> so inshallah, tomorrow uh, at 1 p.m. at Masjid al-Shaheed, there will be a, a talk by Imam Yahya Abdullah, inshallah, and the, t and the uh, title of that will be uh, Afrocentrism Minus Islam Cheats. Is that correct? Okay. That's at 1 p.m. at Masjid al-Shaheed. And also, uh, last announcement. Before the last announcement, are you all having a good time tonight? Are you all happy? Is it nice to be sitting with all these different Muslims from different, different origins? Alhamdulillah, isn't it beautiful? We need to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. I'm looking up here, it's just a beautiful scene. I just had to say that. But uh, who wants to do this again? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Takbir. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. The last announcement, mass youth. Uh, is having a youth program at the Mass Center every Friday night. So there are age groups from 7 and 8 year olds, 9 to 12 year olds, and also 13 and up, inshallah. That is every night at Mass, Friday night at 7 p.m. Assalamu alaikum. We have uh, the questions ordered, and, and mashallah, we got. Tons and tons of, we have stacks of, of questions over here. We're going to try to get through as many as we can, inshallah. Um, and uh, we're going to try to pinpoint some of the ones that um, had to do with the specific topic today. Um, inshallah, in, in the future, uh, we'll have future topics on many of the questions that, uh, that uh, a lot of the audience has proposed. So um, we're going to start, um, since we're going to do a by imam to begin, and, uh, and, and speaker, um, if we can have Dr. Ihab. Um, come up to the front right now and I, we can ask some of these questions in order for you to answer them. Well, there's some that are pinpointed specific to, to, to uh, specific speakers. And we'll try to fit everybody in, inshallah. Okay. Yeah, microphone that we can pass to everybody has to come here. It's not that good. Okay. Just for the, for the sake of time, for the sake of time, what we're going to do is just have you stand up wherever you're at and just speak up. You have a beautiful voice. Especially. It's okay. I, I can come here. That's Are you fine. sure? I, because speaking up is not. Okay. I don't want to yell, you know. <laughs> okay, so what are our questions? Go ahead. First question, inshallah, will be uh, who determines what is acceptable, what is an acceptable disagreement? And what's not. And what's not, of course. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Before I start answering this question, I would like to make some comments as well. We definitely having this gathering, asking Allah سبحانه وتعالى for rewards, and we are here sincere in in achieving this, and this is why we are here, and we want to be sincere in conveying Allah سبحانه وتعالى words as well. We as Muslims, we are first to protect is our roots and foundations. That is number one, our aqidah, tawheed, and anything that might make our identity as Muslim glory. We don't want that. We want to have a very clear distinction that any of these, uh, uh, any of anything that might influence the Muslim identity in his aqidah and this is well defined and I cannot go in much more detail will not be acceptable uh, as, as a matter of compromise 
And for anyone who wants to be in the line of unity, then you have to just listen to the ayah. Hold to the robe of Allah, as simple as this. And the robe of Allah means Hanafi, Shafi'i, uh, Awza'i, uh, Hanbali. The robe of Allah is the Quran and Sunnah. For anyone to adopt an opinion, he has to have a solid hadith uh, uh, or clear interpretation from the Quran. And to, interpret, uh, to adopt an opinion without a base from the Quran and Sunnah is not acceptable. And there's a nice poetry here, it's been said. وليس كل خلاف جاء معتبر إلا خلافا له حظ من النظر إلا خلافا له حظ من النظر إذا the point he said is not every خلاف is considerable unless if it has its roots in the Quran and Sunnah and نظر here means the Quran and Sunnah and الاجتهاد as well and all the Imam جزاهم الله خير touching this issue very greatly so to show that we we really the beauty of Islam is that we are rigid in our framework. We know exactly our boundaries. We are, not, we are not going to destroy that. Because if we destroy that, simply Allah will replace us with another generation. That will keep his image, or the image of our deen, okay? But at the same time, we should not just take this attitude of my way or the highway. We cannot just, we have to be, you know, I, want, I like the word tolerance, I like the word uh, listening, I want the love being constructive, dialogue to understand. You know, are we within the framework? <coughs> Brothers and uh, sisters, you know, I, I, my bag here is full of books that talks about these issues. This needs a workshop, not a one hour, okay? But I'm going to tell you this is a two volume book of Al-Atisam that talks about exactly how, uh, how is, you know, uh, where are the frame, what is the framework here? But let me just give a very, you know, I give two examples here, or two rules. Number, number one is identity and aqidah, there's firm boundaries. The next one is, in any opinion, it's not like somebody asking, brother, why you didn't do that? This is, or why you do that? This is haram. He said, no, but there's another opinion. This is not an acceptable answer. It's not because there's another opinion that means you have to take it. You have to ask, as, as Imam Yahya said, ask what is the dalil. You take it from that imam or that imam or whoever imam, do you have this conviction in your heart that he has the need to support you? And we ask all the time when you go to the doctor, when you give you a diagnosis, you ask all kinds of questions to the doctor. And why is that? And you go to another doctor and you ask and you investigate. When you come to our dean, sometimes we like to find the easy way and just take any opinion? No, it's not acceptable. This is not considered. We need to have firm belief that the opinion of I take to the best of my understanding, to the best of my understanding, that is a, a correct opinion. So there's nothing wrong for asking any imam, what's your dalil for saying that? What's the dalil? And is the dalil is clearly communicating this, this opinion that you are, you are hearing? Yeah. If anyone have an opinion based on a dalil from the Quran and Sunnah, an authentic Sunnah, then there's no room for dispute. But there is a room for dispute if someone take an opinion that is outlier from the majority of the ulama and he does not have any dalil from the Quran and Sunnah. Otherwise, we do not have any deen because everybody can go any direction. So we definitely have to have this boundary and I hope this brings a closure to this. Another question? Um, the okay, thanks. Yeah. Jazakallah khair for your answer. Um, in an event to try to uh, to try to speed it up, I'm um, going to ask Brother Shamruddin um, this question. Do you have to follow a madhab? If you do not have one, do you have to select one? And why do we have madhabs if we all are Muslims and we are supposed to follow the Sunnah and the Quran? <coughs> sunnah and the Quran. So, Brother Shamruddin. That's a tough one. It's a tough one. <laughs> it's a long question, but I'll answer it briefly from my own personal. <laughs> Position. Can you hear me at the back there? Oh. Oh. You cannot? <laughs> it's static. It's very static. It's very bad. Depending on who you ask that question, you get a different answer. Yeah. For myself, I don't have a madhab. I don't see the need for one. And if anybody thinks I need to have one, 
he will have a hard time convincing me. So I, I don't know. Does anybody else want to elaborate on that topic? I can, but I don't no, no, no. want to. Yeah, you got three minutes. You can. Yeah. We want to limit responses to three minutes so we can get to more questions. Sure. Um, I just wanted to make one point about because I want to make a little bit from my own perspective uh, the clarity on the first question. Um, what is the boundaries? There's something in Islam called Ma Ulima min ad bil durura. If you look into the books of Usul, and there's a bab called Ijma. There is a chapter in all uh, scholarly principle books. It's about the consensuses. And so there are things that are known by nature of this deen. That's what it is, and there's no question about it. Nobody can come to you and say, well, in my madhab, we have six prayers a day, right? When I was sitting with the sheikh one time, I saw that he, he says, uh, So I asked him, why do we have to have ijma? He said, this is something there's an ijma on. In the end, uh, meaning consensus. So there, the things about uh, that, that God is one, the, the angels are a reality, there is jinn, there are certain things that are mentioned in aqidah, in very basic fiqh, the five pillars, these are things that are known by, there's no justification. Somebody cannot say, I'm a Muslim, and so I run to the clubs and I do my thing, but I didn't know that stuff was haram. You can't do like that. It's unacceptable. Nobody can be at a club drinking alcohol and going and committing fornication and say, I didn't know that. These are things clear cut in the Quran. There's no question about it. Now, other than that, which is the majority of Sharia, uh, they can correct me if I'm wrong, but the vast majority of all Islamic law are uh, umur ijtihadiyya, that they are scholarly interpretations. And Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal said about these, man al ijma' faqad kathib. Whoever would claim there's a consensus on this matter uh, of the thing, like for example, you have uh, some people tried to claim that there's an ijma' that it's prohibited to listen to musical instruments. Whereas Imam al shawkani one of the great mujtahideen from, from Yemen, wrote a book, Ibtad Da'wa al Ijma' ala Tahreem al Ma'azif. He wrote a whole book saying that this is a ridiculous claim that has no foundation. There's so many justifications from many great scholars throughout the history of Islam for the permissibility of this, as long as it came with decent, good poetry that does not ruin your uh, aqidah and corrupt that and so forth. So that's basically that. As far as the madhab thing, the scholars have said that it's not necessarily that you follow a uh, Hanafi, Shafi, but you should in learning your deen starting from the beginning start with a very qualified scholar that you have access to and try to stick with them until you can start to understand these things that I talked about in Usul. When you start to get to understand the difference between Usul, now you can compare between the different scholars and madhabs and make an individual uh, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what you're willing to meet him on the day of judgment uh, for yourself. Uh, me personally, in most of my ibadat, I'm, I'm hanbali because I was trained thoroughly and I sat with a scholar. But most of the things that are going on in the world and, and everything else, I'm like Shem din I cannot take what somebody said a thousand years ago after I've been offered the tools by a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the uh, environment I was blessed with to know to differ, look at these differing opinions. There is a big disservice in this ummah that wants to treat us all like idiots. Like we're all completely dumbfounded and we cannot grasp the Qur'an and Sunnah. So therefore you common lay folk can never understand. It's kind of like they were doing with the Catholicism before. And we should be the last people to accept this. So we go to the different people of knowledge and we ask them. We look into our hearts. We look in what we see in the Qur'an and Sunnah. We think what makes sense, what fits my understanding of Islam and we do it. As the brother said, you know, if you're simply looking for an opinion that suits your desires, this is a weakness in Iman. But as Imam Jad al Ali Haq al Jad said, who was the Sheikh al Azhar from three decades ago, that if somebody is looking to an Islamic scholar of qualified reputation for an opinion about understanding Islam, tas'alu ala dhikri in kuntum la ta'lamun, ask the people of knowledge if you don't know, you cannot blame that person. Even if it may be that they have weak iman and they want to make the deen to support their desires. But I can tell you one thing. If 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed it and there are great scholars who took the opinion based upon that revelation. It is not dalal. It is a human, it is an opinion and the Prophet says, Man ijtahid fa asab falahu ajran. Man ijtahid fa akhta falahu ajr. That the one who took a, uh, their abilities and strive to explain uh, what they think is the ruling and they were right, they get two hasanat for it. But the one who happened to make a mistake still gets a hasana. And the one who followed them because they don't know the detailed rules, not, neither one of them can be blamed for some sort of a sin. So this is inshallah, wallah alam, my personal perspective of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala wa alam. We have our next question directed towards Imam Khalil, but I think more than one person can answer this question. Um, and it might not require coming up. But... Um, Imam Khalil, could the Imams of Charlotte possibly be guest Imams uh, once in a while in meshes other than their own um, that they lead regularly? Um, in this person's humble opinion, it would unite um, and acquaintance the community. Yeah. There's a second question for you. The answer that, to that question is yes. I've been the ma'am, uh, the, the, the katee at Mass, ISGC, and some of you may not know, ICC. If I've been to all of those masjid, I've conducted Juma out there. And you all are welcome to come to Masjid al You know, so our doors are open and I think that we can work together. And another question, um, uh, when Imam Khalil says, O oh people, and this is in quotes, um, O oh people we have created from male and female, what does this mean, P.S. I am nine, smiley face? It means, it means according to the Quran that we all come from one, a single parentage. We come from the same essence. Nets and white, one soul. That's what it means. So in spite of our diversity and the differences that we have, what unites us is our common humanity. And I think that should cover it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, this question is uh, direct to our Imam Yahya Abdullah. Uh, in the light of today's topic, what role does culture play in our interaction with one another? Again, in light of this topic, what role does culture play in our interaction with one another? Uh, thank you very much. That's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, culture varies. We know this. From nation to nation, society to society, people to people. And uh, Imam yeah, yeah, he addressed something. He was talking about music. And I remember hearing this hadith when I, early on, I uh, became a Muslim. And I like music. Yeah, I like jazz. See, <laughs> yeah, I do. And I, like, and I like some of the good rap. There's a rapper, a young Muslim brother named Khalil Islam. Powerful rapper. But when I was in Saudi Arabia, I went to the festival called the Festival of Janaria. You know, any of you all familiar with that, the Festival of Janaria? Ah, okay, this brother knows. So I'm there before this correction, Imam Yahya, and they start music, beating on the tambourines, dancing, the sword dancing. And I'm in Saudi Arabia, and the scholars took us there. And, and so it was a wonderful festival, uh, they did the sword dance. They were doing the dance of the sword and fajitos, Janaria. And I'm sitting there going, well, well who, who said this, that you couldn't have the culture, the music, and the dance? The, this was wonderful dance. And the scholars turn to us and they say, are you enjoying this? <laughs> I say, yes, we are. And I couldn't wait to get back to the United States of America to tell them, okay, that hadith that you all read, I saw the scholars, we were enjoying some music in Saudi Arabia. Now, speaking of culture, uh, I want to say this, but I don't want to offend anyone, so I have to give a disclaimer before I say this, okay? 
No, seriously, I'm serious about this. African American Muslims, too many of them, think that to be a Muslim, they must copy the culture of other Muslims. From Pakistan, from Saudi Arabia, from even Nigeria, Kenya, and elsewhere. And so if you all can help me out, and help us, no, I'm serious. When you're speaking to our brothers, the new who are coming to Muslim, even if they're already Muslim, say to them, Islam does not require that you change who you are in order to be a Muslim. Be excellent in whatever you have. Imam Abdul, I'm sorry for having you sit down. There's a second question here. For you. <laughs> what is your opinion on Sharia in the United States? Sharia law oh, that's a good one. in the United States. <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. Uh, the Imam, they know. Most Muslims forget the other word that's in the Quran. Sharia what men have. Mm. All we ever hear is Sharia, Sharia, Sharia. Shira, one minhaj. Allah mentions this together. The road, Shira, the street. Shira, street. Street. And a minhaj, an open way, how to apply the law. And Allah says to everyone, Kurli. To everyone he has given the kulli, shira wa minhaj. So let us not confuse the American society by making them think. Now we know we are Muslims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Imam scholars can correct me if I'm wrong, say that in the judgment day, the Jews will be judged according to the Torah. The Christians will be judged according to their Bible. Muslims will be judged according to the Quran. So we shouldn't work to try to impose our law. Let not have fit this. This is in the Quran. We shouldn't work to try to impose a law that most Muslim nations aren't even following. Most of them, most of the Muslim countries, are not following Sharia, Sharia in the Quran. Now we know this. So we come to America and we make all, not all of us, not all of us, we make making these demands. We need Sharia in America. Well, you, you should try it back in your country where you had a majority of the Muslims in your land. <laughs> America already has Sharia. And if you know the religion, you know that uh, in, in the uh, Supreme Court of the United States of America, there's a frieze that has there Muhammad the Prophet the people who founded this nation of America, many of them were knowledgeable of the Quran. Thomas Jefferson, Quran sits in the Library of Congress right now. When Keith Ellison, the Muslim uh, congressman, was being uh, sworn in for Congress, someone told him, say, look, go to the Library of Congress and get Thomas Jefferson's Quran. Now there was a big news splash, I don't know if you recall it, big news, they were complaining in the news media, oh Keith Ellison, he's a Muslim and he wants to put his hand on the Quran in it. And then someone says, well he's going to the Library of Congress to get Thomas Jefferson's Quran. <laughs> and when he brought Thomas Jefferson's Quran back, no more discussion in the news media about the Quran. <laughs> America already has a Sharia, much of it all comes from the Quran and Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> This the question is directed towards anybody who would like to answer it um, on the panel. Um, what is the Muslim community's engagement and involvement in politics? Or what should it be? Is the question. Anybody who feels comfortable answering that question may step up. The question again is, what is the Muslim community's engagement and involvement in politics?
Well, just answering from my own experience, we have within our association, our community, mayors. We have mayors. We have people in the House of Representatives. We have people in city council. We have a man sitting right in front of us. They, uh, now Steve McGee, he spent, was it four, eight years on city council. My opinion is that if we don't get involved in politics to try to make a difference, someone else is going to make rules for us. So you can't be out by yourself. You have to be involved. I know that's been a big question and a debate, because I've been to some of the meetings, especially when you have people who are trying to encourage us to vote. And I say us, I'm talking about all of them. So I, we don't have a problem with voting. I vote, almost everybody in our association vote. And we know that in order to make change, we have to be involved in the process. There's no way for us to make change if we're just bystanders. So we think that the politics is, is uh, very important. And we will say this, uh, you don't have to change who you are in order to be a politician. Be a Muslim. Uphold the principles of Al Islam. Uphold your religion. Be yourself. And Allah will bless you to, to succeed in politics. Thank you. Again, another question uh, you know, targeted to anybody to answer on, tar on the panel. Um, what are the qualifications or qualities of a scholar, Alan, that is capable of doing ijtihad, quotation marks, and offering opinions based on ijtihad? That is the question, and anybody can answer it. I'm going to read the question one more time. What are the qualifications and qualities of a scholar, Alan, quotation marks, that is capable of doing ijtihad and offering opinions based on ijtihad? Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. A couple of this one, but actually when we sat in the meeting, it's, I'm not uh, um, going outside of the framework. When we sat in the meeting and talked about this, we said that each uh, question would come up and each panelist would have an opportunity to give their perspective on that. And I guess time is what killed us, isn't it? Okay. So, um, inshallah, we'll, we'll do this as quick as possible. How many of you have heard that you cannot take part in the disbeliever system of governance? How many of you heard that? Huh? How many of you have not heard that? MashaAllah. Okay. No need for me to deal with that. Okay. For those of you that heard it, did the Prophet ﷺ take part in Kafir politics? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, he did. In the system of Al-Qabaliyya, Al-Arabiyya, he took part in that. He took protection from that, from two disbelievers. I think that anyone who says that it's impermissible, they have a very hard time getting past those. The issue of Ijtihad is different from the issue of ifta. These are two different concepts. Ijtihad, it means someone has a full comprehensive understanding of the Qur'an and the Sunnah and all of the... Um, madahib, they've mastered all of them and they're able to argue their opinion against scholars from each of the madahib and hold their weight to where those scholars from the other madahib says that person is mujtahid. This is ijtihad. You have to know the six sciences of the Arabic language, for brevity I won't mention them. And then there's six sciences of fiqh and usul al-fiqh. And all of that is also combined with uh, understanding the waqa' Al-furu' to taghayyir hasb al-makan was zaman was dhuruf as Imam Shafi said in kitabihi uh, al-um. Uh, he said that the principled uh, rulings of detailed branches of rulings will differ from time to place and circumstances. So you see in the history, the same scholar taking a different opinion because he traveled across uh, uh, a few countries. Now if that is a whole different reality, if that means you've mastered one madhab and you have usul, and you know of different opinions, and you're now what you call naqil al-ilm, you can carry knowledge and properly, professionally explain it, and give your own personal advice to what you think is best for that person, but in the end, al-fatwa ghair mulzim, the fatwa is not something you can force anybody to take. Only qada in an Islamic court 
is something that has to be applied, otherwise you could be prosecuted. So fatwa is anybody who's been trained, usually someone's been through, you know, like a lot of, I don't know, how many of you heard of the deal bend? The deal bend. Dar al-uloom, right? Okay, so we have some of those. Yeah, so they have a system called the alim program, it's like four to six years. And so once they finish, they call that mufti sahab so-and-so, right? And he has, he has been trained in the Hanafi madhab, and he has a general idea of the principles of that madhab, and he's going to give the fatwa accordingly, right? And so similarly as bachelor's and master's programs, people who've been through those generally have uh, the tools. Whoever has sat and soaked up with the scholars, these tools, they can give a scholarly opinion based upon a professional insight that's not just based upon haphazardly reading a book or going to Google, which is not professional insight. They're giving you knowledge on foundational principled guidance, inshallah. Um, the stereotype that's been created is that Muslims don't start on time, Muslims don't finish on time. So because, because it is 9 o'clock, we do want to continue the question and answer because we do have many questions that, that people have and we want to pose to... You have a comment. You have a comment. Thanks. Bismillah <laughs> So just to follow up on uh, Brother Yahya, we agreed to a comment on this. Um, like any other profession in our life, we have, we have to have a qualification for our deen uh, in order to say he is a mufti, grand mufti. And any one of us, I not including, uh, excluding anybody, in Charlotte area, we are trying to copy fatwa to you. You ask question, we know that this has been asked before, right? And we, we copy fatwa. The one who copy fatwa is not a mufti. We just copy that fatwa and we say this is, has been already decided for in the Majama Fiqiyya or Sheikh that will known Grand Mufti. And um, I don't want to go over the e exact conditions. And he has to know the Quran very well. And he has to know Arabic very, very well. He has to know Arabic, he has to know Arabic very, very well. He has to know Arabic very, very well. He has to know Arabic very, very well. And the Hadith, and the, when is it authentic, not authentic, very well. And he has to know Arabic very well. And he has to know Arabic very well. And you know, he knows the reality because a mufti cannot be just disconnected from the reality, the waqa you have. So all of these five conditions. But we will be unable to check these conditions. So what we do here, what we need to do is to say, okay, look, we have a system that will qualify who will be a mufti or not. And we cannot just, you know, uh, 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 earn it because uh, I, I study here for one year or there for two years. A fatwa only can be given from a reliable sources and we know how we get to these reliable sources and we know how to check. These sources could be from universities and some even not even university graduate might be a not mufti. The one graduate from Azhar doesn't mean to be a mufti. Okay, he might help you again as a copy, uh, to copy a fatwa to you. So and if we ask uh, 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 the ulama, is, is this person is a mufti? And this person is qualified to mufti, he, they will tell you. They will, they will be able to tell you uh, this alim is a mufti and this alim is not mufti. And not every imam and not every sheikh is a mufti. But he can be a preacher, he can help Muslims to understand their deen, copy the dalil and copy the fatwa to them. We need to have big, clear distinction between these two. Another important comment to my brother and sister here. We are establishing a methodology. A methodology. I don't want to talk about a specific ahkam. I don't want to talk about music. I don't want to talk about any other hukum. I want to just establish a methodology. And he, as a professor, we teach people how to think, not how to mimic. And, and to think means we have a methodology. And for anything to adopt as an opinion, I will disassociate myself from my culture, from my friend, from anything else, and, and only what in my front, in, my, in, in front of my eyes, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what they are telling me. For any topics, music or non-music. And then, if I find a, a mufti who is well known, give me an understanding, if I cannot reach those, if I cannot reach a conclusion myself, and I find a mufti who is telling me oh, this issue is halal, and he's a reliable mufti, and we know a number of them, then, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, I'm safe. And then, in this way, we, we, call, we call him muqallid. Al-Muqallid madhabuhu madhab mufti. He goes and asks, 
for a fatwa. The mufti gave him the fatwa, خلاص. If he is a reliable mufti, I'll be there. Many, many of them exist. Then, end of the story. We don't have to dispute it. But to go out of all the fatwa and out of all the jamajami faqiyya and, and to go and, and the, we, we, we claim to have our own new thinking and modernized way of Islam, it is not going to be something that, uh, that will unite Muslims. It will divide Muslims further. It will divide Muslims further. Alhamdulillah, Allah gives us a huge flexibility in understanding our deen. And all the madhahab we have, Shafi, Hanbali, Maliki and others, are only different. I can win. I can be one day Maliki, the other day I'll be Jaffe, the third day I will be uh, 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 Hanbali. And there's no, no issue with this. But to completely ignore this heritage of fiqh and opinion of the ulama and again be an outlier, also not acceptable. So there's a huge flexibility and madhab and sunnah wal jama'ah to be in the middle. There are some people who are going to that extreme and there are people going to that extreme. And we need to be in the middle. I will say this and say this. Allah is the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that elaboration, Dr. Um, in, in respect for your time, uh, we would like to continue the questioning. Um, we understand that it is 9 o'clock and, and, and everybody has their duty. So um, just by show of hands, how many of you in the crowd would like us to continue with the questioning um, that we have right now? Um, and if not, um, I guess we're welcome to leave, but I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Um, the, the question does say, why was this program organized by the youth and not the affiliated masaj and not affiliated with any masajid? In my opinion, it should be organized by all masajid. Um, and I'd like to answer that question first by saying I don't want anybody to take credit for something that I came up with. <laughs> that was a joke, but um, anybody is welcome to to answer this question. Um, the boys asleep, man. Huh? The older, the elders are asleep. Okay, we can. I'll answer this. Do you want to? Okay. Salaam alaikum, brothers and sisters. So, alhamdulillah, that the answer to that question is really simple. It is organized by people who are affiliated with Masajid. And alhamdulillah, I'm proud to say that I am affiliated with all the Masajid in Charlotte. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So anybody, I challenge anybody here tonight, anybody here tonight that would like to participate in this event in the future, by all means, see somebody with, uh, with the volunteer badges, or see, my, or see myself, or Sister Rose, or Brother Usama, or any, anybody else here. We would be more than happy to include you in the future uh, organization of this program. Jazakumullah khairan. All right, and now for, now for another question, um, and this can be answered by anyone. Can you advise young people on how to Google Islam? <laughs> Since there is a lot of information on the internet uh, that may be right about Islam, but oftentimes may be incorrect. So. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I have an iPad. I Google all the time. I actually have a software also. There's a software called Al Maktabat al Shamila. If you know Arabic language, that's an excellent software. It has more than 6,000 books. In fact, the latest update tonight 6,600 and odd books. Ummahat al Qutb, the source books of Islamic knowledge. There's a beautiful poem by Imam Shafi'i. I'd like to quote it, translate it, and comment on it briefly, inshallah. Al Imam Shafi'i said, uh, I'm not Shafi'i, I love Al Imam Shafi'i. <laughs> he said, Isbir ala murri al jafa min muallimi, fa illa rusub al ilmi fi nafarati, wa mallam yazuk zulla ta'alumi sa'atan, tajarra zulla al jahli tula hayatihi, wa man fatahu ta'alumi wakta shababihi. فكبر عليه أربعا لوفاته فذات الفتى والله بالعلم والتقى إذا لم يكونا لاعتبار لذاته. So this poem means have patience with the bitterness of dealing with the the teacher. Sometimes teachers can be tough, you know. For verily, uh, knowledge the knowledge is fortified by pursuing it a little bit at a time. And whoever does not taste the humiliation 
of studying for an hour, meaning a small period of time, will gulp from the humiliation of ignorance for his entire life. And whoever misses the opportunity to acquire knowledge at the period of his youth, then make for takbir upon him for his death. Like when you do salat al janata. For verily, the being of the person is with knowledge and taqwa. If the two do not exist, there is no value to his existence. Al-ilm wa tuqa. You have to pursue knowledge. You cannot, you cannot just expect to Google stuff. Even Googling is, is, you know, you need knowledge. You need some amount of foundation to pursue it. Otherwise, it, it, can, be, it can be dangerous. Share Google. It's, it's everybody, everybody out there. Sometimes you would Google, I read stuff, and you'd be surprised the kind of things you read and people present their case with ayahs from Quran and with hadith. And if you don't have the foundation to be able to filter things, you can be terribly, terribly lost. I would love to give you an example, but I know these guys in a hurry. Give me a few more minutes. I want to make a few more comments. When I ask, give me a minute. I'm sure if you Google it, it says it's okay to let the guy talk a few more minutes. A very important thing about differences is to understand the scope of our differences. The scholars have documented a, 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 a study in Islam, a field of study that's called Maqasidu Shariat al Islamiyya, the objectives of the Islamic Sharia. And they have categorized these objectives into three groups what is called a daruriyat, the, the necessities, the absolute necessities, al hajiyat, the needs. And al kamaliyat which is also called a tahsiniyat, the embellishments. You find most of the times, which are the smaller things, and I wish I had time to explain this. The things that we differ in are not things that are really not big things. The outcome, the consequences of these differences are not, are not real huge. The impact are not huge, unless we make them so. Really, where you put your hand, where you pray, or whether you have hat or not, you know? <laughs> Try to cover a bald spot like me. No, no, no. <laughs> I was kidding, yeah. <laughs> or where the length of your pants, or things like that. Non consequential issues, man. We fight over trivial stuff. I call these differences trivial pursuits. <laughs> the things that really do matter, the things that really do matter. The things that really do matter is the number one priority in this deen. Number one priority the scholars have all agreed upon. Al-Muhafadatu ala deen. That we preserve this deen. We receive this deen from the last generation and it is our obligation to pass it on to the next. And this is what generations upon generations since the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have done until now. We need to love and respect them and listen to them. When you hear me say I don't follow a mazhab, don't think I don't know the mazhab. And don't think I don't read the mazhab. And don't think I don't respect them. And many times I, I accept them. But I don't have one I can call my mazhab. If I tell you I'd be lying. I'm too much of an independent thinker. I'm too much of a... Of, of a I, I cannot subscribe to group mentality. If you're a group and I must tag along with you, boy, I'm gonna really create mischief because I have to question stuff. I was born alone, I'll be going into the grave alone, I will stand in front of Allah alone, and inshallah I will enter Jannah with the rest of you. I want to say hello. So you find that if we were to agree, if we were to agree, that let's put, let's put the best in interest of Islam. <laughs> I'm scared of this guy. <laughs> if we put the best interest of Islam and the Muslims in front and give it priority, then all those other, other petty differences would melt away. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us and teach us to love each other because the truth is you have to love each other. You have to really love each other. You have to have taqwa. You have to have humility. You have to be humble. And you have to know your limitation in knowledge. There's a lot of stuff, man. I have a whole lecture going on here. <laughs> but before you are able to avoid conflicts, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us.
Unfortunately, babysitters have to leave at this point. Um, so if you do have children that are being babysit, babysat right now, um, if, if you could uh, please attend to them. Um, we have, and I, didn't, and I apologize for not asking the imams um, about their time as well. We want to make sure we respect your time and that, that, the, um, um, that things go as planned. We have, we have three more questions that we would like to ask. Um, and if that's okay with you all, um, we, we can continue to ask, and whoever would like to participate in the crowd to stay um, and hear these opinions, um, that would be great. Um, the first question, um, and the last three are, 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 are to all the imams as well, and, and speakers. Um, open to everyone. Is a person sinning if he, uh, as a Muslim, uh, used to drink alcohol? Then the person stops and asks for forgiveness, but after a few years, the person drinks again and stops. Is this a sin, and can the person be forgiven? So, I think the essence of this question is forgiveness. Bismillah, hamid al musalli and wabad. The reality of sin is the reality of mankind. We are sinners. And every one of us is a sinner. And I've seen so many circumstances in which someone uh, becomes religiously arrogant. Following shaitan as someone who thinks they're working for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they start judging people. That one did that. And that is a huge sin. That's the root of all sin. Ana khayru minhu khalaqtani min nar wa khalaqtahu min teen. This is the very basis of sin. He said, I'm better than that one. So when any Muslim starts to look at someone else, and they start to say, oh, that one did this and that one did that, they are doing a disservice to their soul in a grave manner. Anybody who did any sin, Babullahi maftuh, the door of God is open until you die. And there are people, as we know the hadith, that will live their whole life as a believer and take in the last few minutes of their life the path of a disbeliever. And they'll end up in Jahannam. They did all kinds of stuff. And everybody knew them as the righteous, pious person. And the opposite is true. When somebody drank alcohol or did whatever, fornication or whatever, and then they repented, that is removed from their situation. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith found in Sahih al-Muslim. And there's a sharh that is with this hadith. مَنِ اسْتَغْفَرَ غَفَرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ وَلَنْ عَادَ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّ فِي الْيَوْمِ Whoever sought the forgiveness of God, and they sinned and they did the same sin 70 times a day, He will forgive them. And He will remove that from their case. The forgiveness and the acceptance of a Tawwab al Rahim al Ghafur al Wadud, we have to know him and we have to try to embody him. Man la yaghfid la yughfar la. Man la yarham la yurham. Whoever is not forgiving and merciful with others will not receive that. Whoever put themselves in the position of Maliki Yawm al Deen when they're supposedly saying at least 17 times a day, Ijlalan li Jalalihi Subhana. That you are Maliki Yawm al-Din. You are the only one sitting on that metaphorical throne or literal, however you want to take. We have Al-Ashaira and the Maturidiyya and the Salafiyya and all of them. Alhamdulillah. You have to recognize that as Muslims, we are individually responsible for our own sins and helping others to leave it. Judging them is counterproductive to our aqidah to who we are and who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that created us. So I would say that, of course, anyone who did any sin and shirk is included. If somebody did shirk and then they repented, they will have that removed from them. The ayah is talking about, This ayah is talking about after you die. If you go to the tafsir. If you've died and polytheism is in your heart, there is no hope for you. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jamia. This is ayah muhkama fi dunya. This ayah says that He will forgive all sins while you're still alive. 
So I ask uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our people in this gathering insha'Allah that we do our best to correct our behavior, our character and our manners and our knowledge and application of that knowledge and that we help others in a positive, gentle, loving, compassionate way as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is knowing him by his asma and sifat al-ula. We have to do it that way because Muslims uh, trying to judge each other and trying to condemn each other is, is not who we are. Inshallah, I have my own son that I have to go take. Jazakumullah khairan, barakallahu fikum. Jazakumullah khair, ma'am Yahya, editor. We're down to two questions. Um, I guess referring to the topic and some of the comments that have been made already, does this all mean that we really cannot completely take fatwa from sheikhs overseas who don't understand American life? That's, that's one of the questions. Does this all mean that we really cannot completely take fatwa from sheikhs overseas who don't understand American life? I'll make sure I take a seat right now. <laughs> Sheikh overseas. Then I need to find some land to get some stability. <laughs> some of the greatest scholars that have great resources uh, and they can provide you with tremendous help are overseas. And there is always the means for a person with basic knowledge here in America to contact them and I think it's absolutely necessary. Taking opinion, brother, is there's a huge part of Islam that is called Al-Urf. It's uh, what you may refer to as tradition. And I know the brother spoke about it uh, before. When, when Islam comes to a place, it does not take away from you your culture. In fact, it confirms your culture unless there is something specific within it explicitly conflicts with the Quran and Sunnah. So when Islam comes to a place, Allah allows the people, He wants the people to remain the way they are unless something they do explicitly conflicts with Quran and Sunnah. And this lesson is even in the Sunnah of Rasulullah And When Islam came to the people in Mecca, Allah allowed them. In fact, one of the primary uh, theme of Surah Al-Ahzab is to confirm the culture of the Arabs for Rasulullah and the companions and for whoever entered into Islam. Except what Allah explicitly forbid. You find when uh, Islam is ported from abroad to America, one of the mistakes we make is we don't strip our culture from it first. We're supposed to strip the, I don't want to call names, you know, the foreign cultures from it and then bring it to America and splice into the, into the, 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 the core of Islam, the core teachings of Islam, the, the culture of the local people. I think that's one of the reasons why we fail miserably. We fail miserably here in the da'wah because we expect people to imitate others. And Allah wants you to be yourself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want us to, to become Arabs or to become Pakistani or to become, you know, Guyanese. I'm already Guyanese. <laughs> So when it is, uh, there's also another concept in Islam that's called muruna to deen or muruna to shariat in Islam, here, which is the flexibility of the deen. There is no Islamic fiqh question that you can ask a faqih, except if the circumstances change, the verdicts will change. See that? And I actually wouldn't mind put out a challenge. Now ask any fifth question. You ask the question, I'll ask you circumstances, and based on your response, the verdict will change. So if a person thinks that you can go and memorize fiqh from the books of fiqh 1,000 years ago or, or however many years ago and verbatim translate them to a different culture so far removed in time and place and in everything and the circumstances have changed and the verdicts will be the same, no it's not. And the mistake I'm about, please give me another minute, this is huge stuff. Yeah. It's because we don't understand, we don't understand the importance of maqasid or shariat al islamiyah Focusing on the objectives of the Islamic Sharia. It's kind of like when you ride a bicycle, look where you're going, don't look at the wheel. 
See that? So those of us who look at the at the zahir of the nusus, the 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 the, the, op, the, op, the apparent meaning or the obvious or the outward the outward meaning of the, the 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 evidences, ignoring the intention behind it, we would always miss our goal. We would miss the objective. What you need to have is not to have a paper map. What you need to have is a GPS system, recalculating route, and that comes about. That comes about when you understand when you understand maqasid al Sharia al You have to focus on the objective, and that's why that's why I'm 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 crazy about this. If you look at that example, allow me another minute, right? Allow me. <laughs> which which one? We'll end here. Okay, make God to close up. So. If you look at that, uh, uh, the little skit that was played out in the hadith that went along with it, the historical fact, you know why the companions differ, differ in, that, in, in that case? Because one group of them were taking the, the explicit instruction of Rasulullah and implementing it. The other group made it clear, actually it's in the hadith of a Bukhari and Muslim. They said, La yurid, uh, Lam yurid minna zalik. Lam yurid minna zalik. And they're talking about Rasulullah and they said he didn't intend it that for us. That's not what he intended. So what they, what they were doing, they were trying to derive from the instruction of Rasulullah his intention behind the command. See that, that's called the objective of the, of, of the command. There is one of the great scholars, and many of them did this in history, but one of them that excelled, uh, that wrote the book Al-I'tisam, he also wrote a book called al um, uh, al Abu Ishaq al-Shatibi. He did something I refer to, I call it reverse engineering of Islamic fiqh. And what that means is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has objectives. And he laid down laws with specific objectives. We don't know those objectives unless he told us. So what al Imam Shatibi did, he looked at the instructions and he tried to derive the objectives and then he categorized them and compiled from that these classifications, these three classifications. But he was not the first. That's not to be a little honest here. He wasn't the first, others preceded him. But he did details in this that nobody else did. And when you look at the deen from this perspective, you find you're awed. You, you realize, wow, this, 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 this deen is beautiful. Things, Allah did not put things haphazardly, there's objectives. And we need to pay attention to those things. And you find a lot of times when we fight, we don't understand that, we, that there are objectives behind this. And if we focus on the main objectives, then the small one, it's okay to let them go. See that? It's okay. This is part of the Sharia. This is part of what Imam Shatibi wrote. What he wrote is that, for example, just, we make the door. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's. So here it is. If it is, we focus on the objectives of the deen. You'll find that most of the time we're fighting in the small things, not the big things. And it's okay for you to give up the small things, compromise in the small things to achieve the big things. For example, al maslahatul aama. مُقَدَّمٌ عَلَى الْمَصْلَحَةِ الْخَاصَةِ This is just an example. And there's many other examples in, 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 in Usul al-Fiqh and Maqasid al-Shariyat al, al islamiya What this states here is that the, the, the benefit to the community takes precedence over the individual benefit. And you find a lot of time if we remember this, we wouldn't fight. We'd be able to, 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 to swallow our pride, to keep our differences to ourselves. And there's an example that I actually do this every year two times. You probably know what I'm talking about. I do this every year two times. I swallow my per personal opinion and I keep it to myself and I go along with the community. What's the best interest of Islam and the Muslims? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us informed of the that's the dua part. Hold on, We're just going to ask just a one minute Okay. Okay, absolutely. Yeah. Again, we, we apologize um, with the time. I mean, I'm a sixth grade social studies teacher, and 11 and 12 year olds are tardy to class. I, you know, I, I, I want to get them in trouble. So, inshallah, we hope we're not in trouble with you all. Um, and, um, and this is just a, t a taste of something that uh, we want to continue in the future. We want to make this a quarterly activity, uh, meaning that it happens four times a year um, with, with uh, either the same group, different groups. 
Inshallah, in the future, we hope to have uh, more participation um, with the number of people that attend, and also, um, um, you know, uh, a diverse group of speakers um, that can better uh, uh, that can better uh, convey uh, the views of, of the community. Um, this is a learning experience for for, for this group, uh, Charlotte Muslim Forum, um, and the next generation of Muslims. So, Inshallah, in the future, we'll, we'll make sure. Um, that we have a nice place for us to, uh, to pray Isha. Unfortunately, this room um, didn't accommodate for us. Uh, the only space was in front of some restrooms, so and we know that's not adequate. Um, and um, uh, we, we look forward to, to, your, to your feedback. If you would like to fill out a note card about future topics, the, the first hour of the session will always be about um, a discussion of, of, of a certain topic important to the community, and the second half will always be a question and answer. So, um, if you have suggestions for future topics, we are going through these questions that, that were unfortunately not answered um, for, for some suggestions. But if you do, um, please, uh, uh, please uh, pass those forward. And uh, we're going to um, close out with uh, some dua from uh, Brother Shabbardin, um, inshallah. Oh, and I forgot. Thank you for coming. O oh Allah, we praise you with praises that only you with all your might and majesty deserve to be praised with. We ask you to shower your choicest blessings and send your peace on Rasulullah and on his wives, our mothers, the mothers of the believers, and upon his companions, and upon all those who follow them in goodness until the day of judgment. O oh Allah, we ask you to help us to learn our deen and to teach it to the best of our ability. Allah, we ask you to help us to be amongst those who carry this deen to others and who defend this deen and who support this deen with all their ability and with all their wealth and with all their knowledge. Allah, we ask you to put love between our hearts and respect for each other and tolerance for each other. Uh, Allah, we ask you to make us put the interests of Islam and the Muslims in front, of our own, in front of our own personal goals. Allah, we ask you that even though we will continue to differ in small things, that we do not differ in what is more important, that we all worship you and support this deen. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen.